Well, hello there. Thank you for joining me for the latest edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. On this week's show, we'll take you to Port Hawkesbury for a rundown of some rules and regulations regarding Phase 5 of Nova Scotia's reopening strategy. You can get to a lot of places now that you couldn't before, but you also have to show proof of vaccination to get into a lot of these places, including some that you might not have expected. So we're going to speak to the CAO of the town of Port Hawkesbury, Terry Doyle, and the town's director of finance, Aaron McCacken, about what's happened in Port Hawkesbury to accommodate for the new Phase 5 rules, including what's happening at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center. We'll also go to another part of Port Hawkesbury, Granville Green's Band Shell. Now that's been the spot of a lot of colorful, high-flying concerts over the years, but on the first Sunday afternoon of October, it was the site of a somber firefighters memorial service. And we'll show you what happened there and how local firefighters that have fallen over the past two years have been honored. But we begin with the first of three segments from the recent regular council meeting of Richmond Municipal Council. We're going to take a closer look at the discussion that goes into the decisions that happen at Richmond Council, including conversations between the five elected councillors and CAO Don Marchand. Here's the first of those, going back to a story that we first covered for you in the very early stages of Tell Hill 24-7, a new Strait of Canso Causeway Gateway strategy that's being authored by the Cape Breton Partnership with some help from the municipal councils and indigenous communities around Cape Breton Island. Should Richmond County put another $5,000 into these studies? Let's listen to what Warden Amanda Mumberkett and your councillors had to say about all this right now. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the Strait of Cancel Gateway Project. So this project um, is back on our agenda because we're really at the next stage. You'll recall, I think some time ago, we had a presentation on it. Um, the county has already submitted a letter of kind of support and principle for the idea. Um, but right now, uh, the stage we're at is the preparation of a multifaceted, multi-year plan that will act as the basis for the Strait of Cancel Gateway Project for Cape Breton and the Mogi. So the Cape Breton Partnership has been taking a lead on this. They've provided a draft request for proposals, which would seek a multidisciplinary uh, consultant team to prepare a development strategy for the project. Um, and that RFP was uh, provided in the package. But prior to issuing the RFP, they are looking to confirm some funding commitments from stakeholders and partners. They're estimating the detailed development strategy will cost in the range of fifty to $70,000. Um, there is a commitment from a COA to fund half of such a planning strategy up to a total of $35,000. Um, and so with those figures in mind, um, the Cape Breton Partnership was seeking municipalities uh, to commit uh, up to, I think, a total of $5,000 each. Um, and so that is the amount that they're, uh, that they're requesting that we invest in this project. I do want to also mention um, that uh, they've got committed funding from the Town of Port Hawkesbury and Destination Cape Breton uh, Association in the amount of $5,000 each. Um, they've, also, uh, they've also, I think, received verbal agreement from Victoria County and Inverness County for a contribution of up to $5,000. The intention is then uh, for them to go back and also ask the Cape Breton and Lumagi First Nations chiefs for a single contribution together um, towards the project as well. Um, so I think at the end of the day, what they're saying is, you know, what the, the last correspondence I had from Lynn on this was that each funding partner has been asked to commit up to 5,000, but depending on the number of, uh, you know, quotes received for the work and then also the funding committed uh, by the various partners, we may, it may be a lesser amount than 5,000. So five would be the maximum. Um, and I think in addition, the, uh, the Gateway Project is gonna be discussed with the uh, CBRM this coming week, so, or this later this week. So, so we do have some municipalities on board um, as well as Destination Cape Breton Association. I wanted to open it for discussion with council at this stage. If you feel that we should be, um, you know, maybe instructing staff to, uh, you know, to find us a, find us some budgetary room to support it to the tune of $5,000 maximum. So any thoughts from councillors on this? Maybe uh, Councillor Brent, Samson, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, I'm assuming that would uh, would definitely be within this year's budget. Uh, it would. Or when, when is, okay, they require a minute. So um, I, I guess, yeah, my only question would be 
to the CAO as to where we could possibly find it. But I mean, I think in principle, I'd definitely be in support of the project. Mm -hmm. Me too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's a, it's, it's necessary. It's a great project. You know, it, it's, it's a big bang for $5,000. The question always for me is where does the money come from? I think that's a question for, for, for the CAO and the CFO to, to see if there's a spot in the budget where we can make that work, so. Do we still have that trio back behind the municipality or is it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Our money trees. The money trees. The, um, I, I agree uh, with, with both councillors. Uh, it is a big bang for the buck and um, yeah, I'm in full support. Thanks. Councillor Sean Sampson? Yeah, yeah. Same, same here for sure. It's, it's an important project and being being involved in the tourism industry for the past 28 years. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's a big project and that, that gateway into uh, in, into Cape Breton and into our area is, is, is going to be an important uh, step forward, right? So yeah, I support that fully. Up. And you know, that, that consultation that spoke about in this letter with, with all the municipalities and First Nations uh, communities. Uh, yeah, so Hopefully, we can find uh, find the funding and and, and help uh, move this project forward. Okay, thanks. I mean, I know you know there's always going to be in the run of a year expenses that crop up that are that are unplanned, right? So, um, and in, in the scheme of things, I'm you know I'm not sure I would consider this really a material amount in the scheme of our budget. But yeah. uh, Don, if you had any comments you wanted to add, um, yeah, actually, I do. Um, I'm just wondering. I'm, I'm I read the. Uh, the correspondence from Lynn McClellan, McClellan, and I don't see anywhere in there where they're talking about a time frame or a or a specific time uh, to provide this funding. So I'm just wondering, um, do you do you get a sense of when we need to make a decision on this? Well, I think sooner rather than later, so that they can issue the RFP. And I, I you know, I do know that the that the ACOA funding I think is scheduled for this fiscal year. So. You know, you know, the project itself is going to take probably a couple of months to complete. Um, so I think they're just trying to line up their funding sources as soon as, as soon as possible. Okay, so essentially we have a little bit of time that we can dis I can discuss this with, uh, with the CFO and perhaps try and locate an area where, uh, where we might be able to uh, accommodate. Um, and perhaps I can provide some uh, information at a later meeting with respect to that. Uh, that funding request is if that's okay with you folks perhaps you can make a motion to um uh, permit staff to uh provide a report sure yeah does that make sense for council okay if there's time for that that's obviously preferable yeah it looks yeah. it sounds like there is i think it, i think there is yeah yeah um, is it possible to, uh, and I don't want to put time frame because I honestly don't know, is it possible, uh, you think, Don, to have it for the community a whole meeting to then have it, I guess, for our next, to approve it, I guess, at our next meeting, then it'll be in the, we're looking at the end of October then. Well, it w really wouldn't matter if it was the committee to whole meeting or the next council meeting as a committee to whole recommendation is going to go to council anyway. So, uh, sure. you know, either way. If we have it for uh, if we have it for the committee the whole meeting in October, it's not that far away. It's it's exactly two weeks. Um, there are some uh, there are some things going on in the next couple of weeks that may not provide us with that uh, that time, uh, but we can certainly have something for the uh, October uh, council meeting. Okay. So yeah, I guess I would be uh, I'd be okay to make a motion to uh, have uh, staff look into funding or available funding to uh, I guess I don't know support the project. to support the project yeah thank you Brent okay thanks Deputy Warden could I have a second on that motion Councilor Brent Sampson yeah okay um, any further discussion questions Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. 
That motion is carried. We'll have more from the recent Richmond Municipal Council meeting in just a moment. But right now, as promised, here is a special question and answer session with two representatives from the town of Port Hawkesbury who have been seeing how the Phase 5 reopening rules for Nova Scotia are impacting how the town runs its business and how Port Hawkesbury welcomes people to the town's civic center. And we'll begin with some commentary from the person who was front and center during the first two days of Phase 5, the Director of Finance for Port Hawkesbury, Aaron McCacken. Yeah, so um, basically I've been at the, uh, in the box office for the last day and a half, and um, uh, yeah, everybody seems to be coming in ready with their proof of vaccination. We don't require proof of vaccination for folks paying their taxes, doing regular, you know, essential business with the town. We do require it for things like the walking track and, and I know the fitness facility is checking for proof of vaccination within their facility. Even though we're not asking for it from everybody, everybody seems to be stopping and, and, and looking to provide it and having it ready. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I really, it's been, a, it's been a good experience. I think, um, I think there may be some challenges moving forward as we see some larger events, but based on some, you know, uh, hearing about uh, events that have happened in, in large facilities, they they seem to be saying the same thing. You're probably going to have a, a cranky person here, here or there, but from our experience so far, um, just in our regular day-to-day -day business, um, um, there hasn't been the, the citizens and the patrons of the Civic Centre are cooperating very, very well, um, and they're ready to show the proof of vaccination, and um, yeah, it's, it's been... It's been a little added challenge, obviously, because we're stopping everybody as they're coming in or they're stopping. So it's a little added um, um, work at the at the front counter. Um, but um, everybody is very, very willing to show that at this point in time. And uh, if things change, we can report on that as we go along, because um, as we've always said, um, this is going to be a dynamic plan that that we have in our in our phase five reopening and, and we'll adjust as as the situation changes and evolves, um, but as of right now, the, the response seems to be adequate. Now, if you've gotten both of your vaccinations and you have your proof of vaccination, you know that you can print it off or that you can scan a QR code to your phone or similar device. So what are people in Port Hawkesbury tending to use when they come to the Civic Center and show their proof of vaccination? I asked Darren McCachern, the Director of Finance, here's what she had to say. Uh, it's been a little bit of a mix. Um, we don't have the QR code reader. We've been kind of looking, uh, kind of, we've been just trying ones out on the app, um, but they haven't been working for us at this point in time. But most most often, uh, the ones that we're checking, people have them, the paper copy, and they're pulling them out of their wallet. Uh, but one really neat thing I saw, which I thought was a great idea and I'd like to do myself, was um, somebody had a picture and they took a picture of both their proof of vaccination as well as their ID at the same time. Um, which I thought was pretty, pretty neat. Uh, maybe not all places would accept that, um, you know, a digital photo of your ID, but um, for our purposes, it, it was good. And I thought that was really kind of neat because you may be having to pull both of those pieces out if you don't know um, the individual that you're checking on. So um, a mix, but I'd say primarily paper from what I've seen. Now, you might recall that when Erin McKechn first started making her comments, she mentioned that proof of vaccination isn't required to carry out simple business like paying your tax bill within the Port Hawkesbury town offices. So why is that the case? So um, we're following the uh, guidelines that have come out from the provincial government, and there's definitely pieces, things that are, are you most definitely have to show proof of vaccination, and there's, there's places where you don't, and government offices are ones where you don't. So we're following the provincial legislation, which is kind of what we've been doing throughout this whole pandemic, um, and we're, we're basing our response on, on the guidelines they're putting out, and, and um, that's why. So I think if you go into Access Nova Scotia, you're not going to be asked for your proof of vaccination. Um, and you, I mean, we want people to come in and pay their taxes, so um, we're not going to stop anybody from doing that. Now we'll turn to Terry Doyle, the Chief Administrative Officer of the Town of Port Hawkesbury, for some answers on a situation that evolved just over the last month and a half concerning proof of vaccination requirements at the fitness facility within the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. It's been run by a company called Body and Soul since the Cape Breton YMCA left the facility just over a year and a half ago. However, in September, the owners of Body and Soul posted a message on their Facebook page that stated that not only would they not require proof of vaccination, 
but that they would file legal action to try to prevent anybody from insisting that they required proof of vaccination and double vaccinations among those using the fitness facility. That has changed in the past week, however, and now, just like most of the rest of the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre, double vaccination is required for usage of the Body and Soul Fitness Centre. Here's CAO Terry Doyle to explain what happened. So, so we've met with the, with the owners of Body and Soul, um, and they've indicated that they will be in full compliance with, the, with government regulations with the Phase 5 reopening plan, and um, uh, we follow that up uh, twice, and all indications are, are things are going very well at, in the fitness center. We met with the um, with the owners, and it was not a difficult decision for them to make. They realized how the you know how the law worked, uh, and um, and the stance that the town of Port Hawkesbury had, uh, and they, they have you know they have a philosophy with respect to vaccines, which they're you know certainly willing to communicate. However, uh, the laws in Nova Scotia are the laws in Nova Scotia, and the town of Hawkesbury is certainly going to abide by that, and, and so are all stop all of our lease orders. So, um, so there, was, there was really no issue. According to CAO Terry Doyle, the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center's new proof of vaccination protocols were a true team effort, not just among the main users of the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center, including the Body and Soul Fitness Center and hockey teams like the Straight Junior B Pirates and the Capit Highlanders, but also among different departments and different town staff to be able to pull it all together. So staff worked, worked um uh, together with our partners, especially our major users. So we've had discussions with um, with all major users, including the Pirates and Cabot Highlanders and Minor Hockey Association, uh, and discussions on how this would work. Uh, we offered uh, support in that area, so we're, we're increasing our, our security um, assignments, uh, especially on the weekends. Um, and uh, so we gather as much information as we could. We, we started working on this uh, quite some time ago when we realized this was coming into effect. And, and then uh, and, and drafted a document um, with respect to how we were going to carry out compliance and perfected that as we moved along. And on Friday, we met with council and had an information session uh, back and forth on that and made some adjustments uh, with council at that time and, and then uh, had the press release go out that afternoon on, on changes. Civic Center is a big is uh, uh, we have a lot of customers um, and a lot of people who rely on the services that we that we have here, and, and we're trying to make this uh, this compliance as, as easy as we can to, for the public and and for our major users. So um, yeah, a lot of people working together and a lot of good information and uh, a lot of help from from the province as well in answering questions and, and moving forward. And one final clarification on the vaccine protocol for the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. Yes, you will need proof of vaccination to be able to attend hockey games, but once you're inside Veterans Memorial Arena with your proof of vaccination, there's no limit on attendance, and you can go anywhere you want, including the canteen facility now operated by the Barrican Bistro. There's no, uh, no restrictions on attendance, uh, on, on attendance numbers. And uh, there's uh, proof of vaccination will be required for, for all those attending. The way it's going to work is um, so when you're going to a pirate game or a, or a cabot game or if you're going yeah. for minor hockey, uh, when you when you go through when you go past the desk, you're you've already shown proof of vaccination. You go to the canteen, you're fine. So that's what we've told uh, the 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 canteen provider. Um, that's you know when people come there, they've already been checked. The only time it becomes an issue is during the day. Um, because there's various things that you don't need your passport for uh, during the day. Thanks once again to the CAO of Port Hawkesbury, Terry Doyle, and to Aaron McKechn, the Director of Finance for Port Hawkesbury, for answering my questions about how Phase 5 has changed things at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. Right now, we're going to take a look at recreational activities in Richmond County, specifically the use of all-terrain vehicles on local trail systems. We spoke about this issue back in March on Tellil 24-7, and now we're going to revisit it thanks to a request that was recently made to Richmond Municipal Council by the Coastal Riders ATV Association. They are hoping to be able to get some support for the development of a trail system connected between Lynch's River and Salmon River Road. So how is that all going at the council table? Here's a recent segment of Richmond Council's September 27th regular meeting to explain how things went. 
Raymond Barrett is the secretary treasurer of the Coastal Riders ATV Association. He is seeking a letter of support for a specific project. He's in the process of applying to the Nova Scotia Lands and Forestry Off-Highway Vehicle Infrastructure Fund trails to construct a trail using the old number four roadbed. The club has a permit from the Nova Scotia Transportation Infrastructure Renewal, or Nova Scotia Public Works now, I believe, for the use of route 21-65. The funding request is for a section of trail known as the old number four highway. It runs from Lynch's River to Salmon River Road, a distance of about three kilometers. The work will consist of redoing the ditches, replacing one bridge and several culverts, removing vegetation, trees, grading the existing roadbed and resurfacing with gravel. It's a fairly large project. They figure likely in excess of $40,000. Um, there is a map attached to this was in the package. The fund requests uh, that the club show that they have support of municipal government. He is requesting a letter of support on letterhead from the municipality for this project. And then there's uh, the map attached, as I was saying. So they're not looking for a financial support at this time. It's just uh, support in principle, basically, that we're sort of behind the project in that, because that would help them in, in securing funding through the province. Any any questions for Councillor Sampson on that item? Excuse me, Brent, did you say that runs along the Lynch's River Road? Uh, it's between Lynch's River and the Salmon River Road. Okay. Yeah. If I, I, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm my guess is that this is also part of the, um, the work that's being done to have multi purpose trails, right? So the intention is not to uh, do the work to the trail for it to just be used for OHV, right? It's also to be used for other purposes. Uh, I'd have to check specifically with them. I would assume so, but I'm, I, I can't say with 100% certainty, but mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that there's any restrictions on their trails that I've ever been aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the same fund that most of the um, yeah. Clubs are, yeah. So that's actually it's the name of the fund. It's called yes. the all which V OHV infrastructure, infrastructure. Fund, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. Yeah, but the intention I think is that. So I guess that was my question, and then I guess I have a comment, which is, um, you know, we've been supporting other clubs who are creating multi-purpose trails throughout Richmond County. Uh, we've been supporting them financially, but also in terms of letters of support. And I think this is just another piece of that puzzle to continue the trail uh, infrastructure in the county. And I definitely would be in support of providing such a letter. Thank you, Councilor Nolan Sampson. Deputy Warden, did you yeah, have I, any comments? I do. I, I agree. That's, uh, you know, it's nice to see the initiative um, expanding and the people putting the work into the trails and making them grow. So. Uh, like Councillor Melanie Sampson, I'm 100% supporting behind it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sean Sampson. Yeah, for sure. For sure. To, to echo uh, Councillor Melanie and Deputy Warden's uh, words, uh, I'll be supporting it as well. Uh, going back to what Councillor Melanie said, you know, we, we have to make sure that we're, you know, we're discussing multi-use rails, right? So hopefully that's what this is about. And, uh, multi-use is where it's going, right? But yeah, it's 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 great to see initiatives and, and trails being uh, developed in, in our county for sure. Let's return now to the town of Port Hawkesbury and specifically to the Granville Green Banshell site. That was the spot where a solemn ceremony was held on Sunday afternoon, October the 3rd, to honor volunteer firefighters who have lost their lives over the past two years. Typically, the ceremony would be held every year by members of the Strait Area Mutual Aid Association, but this time around, it was two years worth of volunteer firefighter passages that were noted, simply because the ceremony that would have been held last year was scuttled because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the accompanying social distancing restrictions. Let's take you to Granville Street right now and to a gathering that will not soon be forgotten by all those that were in attendance on Sunday afternoon, October the 3rd. On a quiet Sunday afternoon in October, at the Granville Green Banshell site in Port Hawkesbury, volunteer firefighters gather in full uniform, and flags fly. However, even though these flags aren't, in the strictest definition of the term, flying at half-mast, don't underestimate the solemn and somber nature of this ceremony on Granville Street.
The people in these uniforms are members of volunteer fire departments serving under the Straight Area Mutual Aid Association. And due to COVID-19 and its accompanying social distancing protocols, this is the first time since 2019 that these firefighters have been able to gather together to hold a fireman's memorial service. And to further accommodate Nova Scotia's social distancing protocols and gathering limits, this year they're holding the ceremony outside at the Granville Green site on Granville Street in Port Hawkesbury. This is Roy McKinnon of the Harvard Boucher and District Volunteer Fire Department. Today, he has the sad duty of reading the names of nearly three dozen volunteer firefighters that have lost their lives since 2019. Some are represented by a single person. Others are represented by multiple members of the deceased's family. In each case, a helmet is put on a table in front of the Granville Green stage to honor the fallen. And after each helmet is put on this table, Roy McKinnon rings a bell and the sound of that bell spreads into the air on this Sunday afternoon to honor each firefighter that has lost a life in the past 24 months. gives way to peaceful hymns. Isabella Sampson, an up-and-coming singer-songwriter from Richmond County, plays an instrumental version of How Great Thou Art before proceeding to Amazing Grace. And to end a ceremony that began with Roman Catholic Deacon Berkeley Guthrow reciting a fireman's blessing, the chief of the Port Hawkesbury Fire Department, Donald McDonald, delivers the last alarm. O oh God, the Supreme Lord of the universe and all humankind, who disposes all things in accordance with thy divine plan, heed our suppliant prayers to you. You have called forth from this world the soul of our fellow firefighters. May your justice and mercy be extended to them in judgment, so they may enjoy rest and peace and happiness with you forever. May your tender compassion be granted to us and to all their loved ones who mourn their passing from this life. Bestow on us the right to be rejoiced with them in possessing you forever in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. The gravity of this day is not lost on those in attendance, including three provincial MLAs from the straight area, Cape Breton Canso MP Mike Kellaway and Port Hawkesbury Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton. Two days later, at Port Hawkesbury's regular town council meeting, Mayor Chisholm Beaton offered special acknowledgments to the Port Hawkesbury Fire Department and all those participating in the Fireman's Memorial Service. Following the meeting, when speaking to reporters, here's what the mayor had to say. Well, it was certainly a, a humbling and, and also solemn event. Uh, and just the, the visual act of of the placement of the firemen's firefighters' helmets uh, on the table in front of the Granville Green stage was just con very powerful, uh, and it certainly made me feel grateful uh, that um, each one of those uh, helmets represented um, a, a firefighter that uh, sacrificed a great deal. Uh, in service to uh, our community as well as many of the uh, 29 other communities that are directly involved with the mutual aid um, of the strait. And just also incredibly grateful um, watching some of the family uh, help place those helmets uh, on display was also incredibly moving because of course um, our, our firefighters who have passed uh, have, have made a great sacrifice, but oftentimes we don't think of the families of the firefighters who also sacrifice um, when there is a response to fire or accident. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, they're, they, they're missing their, their person um, quite a bit throughout the year. Uh, so it was very moving. And it was also nice to see, just despite COVID, it was nice to see that uh, great uh, attendance there. Uh, the, it looked a little like we were going to get rained on, but the sun ended up coming out in the end, uh, which was nice. And I really do um, 
I really do thank the Port Hawkesbury Volunteer Fire Department. They did a wonderful job hosting it this year. And uh, it was great uh, to see some of our local MLAs in attendance, as well as our uh, member of Parliament, Mike, Mike Lillie, in attendance. Yeah. Uh, to come out and pay their respects. And as the firefighters, families, dignitaries, and members of the general public left the Granville Green site on that Sunday afternoon in Port Hawkesbury, they were grateful to finally have an opportunity to say goodbye to so many loved ones who had put their lives on the line every day of their lives to be able to provide security and rescue services to so many others around the Strait area. In Port Hawkesbury, Fort Hill 24-7, I'm Adam Cook. Let's return now to the virtual Municipal Council meeting held by Richmond County on September the 27th and one more segment dealing with council business, specifically grant requests from community organizations. You might be surprised to see what organizations received funding and which were turned down, especially since not all of the organizations were located directly in Richmond County. I move the council accept the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole and that request for funding from the Lennox Passage Yacht Club in the amount of $500 be approved from the District 2 Fund. Right, so the motion's been made by the Deputy Warden. Can I have a seconder on that? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Councillor Sean Sampson. Any further discussion? Question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion, uh, those opposed? Okay, that motion is carried. I move the council accept the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole and that the funding request from Raising the Village Corporate of Limited Type 4 Regional Health General Grant Funds be approved in the amount of $2,500 with $250 being distributed from each of the five district funds and the remaining $1,250 being distributed from the general grant fund. Okay, so there's a motion been made. There was some additional discussion about this at Committee of the Whole, and we may need to make an adjustment here, but um, but at this point, because there's a motion on the floor procedurally, I'll just ask for a seconder. Okay, so there's no seconder on that motion. Is there any other discussion um, from Council on it? Question. Well, there's no, there's no motion. Oh, sorry. Yeah, motion wasn't seconded. I just wanted to provide an opportunity um, to uh, for councillors to discuss a potential um, new motion at this point, or um, we can revisit it at the next committee of the whole, whichever. That's uh, so what I was going to say. Is it possible to revisit this at the next committee of the whole? This, um, I, I, I believe I was the one that made the motion on this before, but just unintentionally created consequences I didn't plan to. So I think I'd rather if we brought it back and um, thought of a, a new way to, to go about this. Okay. Any other thoughts from councillors on this? Okay. So um, I don't think we need a motion to bring it back to committee of the whole. Um, we, have, we still have the original application. And so we will just, um, we'll just keep that on our agenda for the next time. Okay, thank you, councillors. Deputy Warden, back to you. <clears throat> I move the council accept the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole and that the request for funding from the River Bourgeois Mariner Society Type 4 Regional Health General Grant Fund, <clears throat> excuse me, in the amount of $1,000 be approved with $500 distributed from District Number 4 Fund and $500 distributed from the General Grant Fund. Okay, so the motion has been made. Could I have a seconder on that? I'll second that. Thank you, Councilor Brent Sampson. Any further discussion? Question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, so motion's carried. I move that Council accept the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole and that the request for funding from the Arishak Community Development Association type regional health general grant fund be approved in the amount of $7,500 with $1,250 distributed from each of the district number one and district number two funds and the remaining $5,000 to be distributed from the general grant fund. Okay, so the motion's been made by uh, the deputy warden. Can I have a seconder on that? Thank you, Councillor Sean Sampson. Um, any further discussion? 
Question? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion is carried. I move that council accept the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole and that the request for funding from the Pan K. Breton Food Hub Co-op Type 4 Regional Health General Grant Fund in the amount of $15,000 be denied due to $2,000 previously allocated in the budget. Okay. So there's a motion from the Deputy Warden. Could I have a seconder on that? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Um, any further discussion? Question. Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, so that motion is carried. And that wraps up this week's edition of Tell Ill 24-7. Thank you for tuning in. And if you have any ideas for future editions of the show, or you just want to comment on what you've seen over the past 45 minutes, I'd love to hear from you. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863. And you can reach me by email by using the address adamjrcook, cook with an E, at gmail.com. And you can also contact Talil Community Television directly with your comments and your ideas for future shows. The station phone number in Irishat is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is info at talil.tv. Don't forget to follow Talil on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and our YouTube channel has every single episode of Talil 24-7, including this one, and the individual interviews and stories from the show. And you can also catch full episodes of Note Coté, our sister French interview program, and all the other different programs that my friends at Talil Community Television put together. I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for watching Talil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye for now.